Chapter 3. Lev. The party is big. The party is expensive. The party has been planned for years. There are at least 200 people in the country club's grand ballroom. Lev got to pick the band, got to choose the food. He even got to select the color of the linens, red and white, for the Cincinnati Reds. And his name, Lev Jedediah Calder, is stamped in gold on the silk napkins for people to take home as a remembrance. This party is all for him. It's all about him. And he is determined to have the best time of his life. The adults at the party are relatives, friends of the family, his parents, business associates, but at least 80 of the guests are Lev's friends. They're kids from school, from church, and from the various sports teams he's been on. Some of the friends had felt funny about coming, of course. I don't know, Lev, they had said. It's kind of weird. I mean, what kind of present am I supposed to bring? You don't have to bring anything, Lev told them. There are no presents at a tithing party. Just come and have a good time. I know I will. And he does. He asks every girl he invited to dance, and not a single one turns him down. He even has people lift him up in a chair and dance with him around the room, because he had seen them do that at a Jewish friend's bar mitzvah. True, this is a very different kind of party, but it's also a celebration of him turning 13, so he deserves to get lifted up in a chair too, doesn't he? Lev finds that the dinner is served too soon. He looks at his watch to see that two hours have already gone by. How could it have gone so quickly? Soon, people grab the microphone and, holding up glasses of champagne, they start making toasts to Lev. His parents give a toast, his grandmother gives a toast, an uncle he doesn't even know gives a toast. To Lev, it's been a joy to watch you grow into the fine young man you are, and I know in my heart that you'll do great things for everyone you touch in this world. It feels wonderful and weird for so many people to say so many kind things about him. It's all too much, but in some strange way, it's not enough. There's got to be more. More food, more dancing, more time. They're already bringing out the birthday cake. Everyone knows the party ends once the cake is served. Why are they bringing out the cake? Can it really be three hours into the party? Then comes one more toast, and it's the toast that almost ruins the evening. Of Lev's many brothers and sisters, Marcus has been the quietest of all, all evening. It's unlike him. Lev should have known something was going to happen. Lev, at thirteen, is the youngest of them. Marcus, at twenty-eight, is the oldest. He flew halfway across the country to be here at Lev's tithing party, and yet he's barely danced, or spoken, or been part of any of the festivities. He's also drunk. Lev's never seen Marcus drunk. It happens after the formal toasts are given, when Lev's cake is being cut and distributed. It doesn't start as a toast. It starts as just a moment between brothers. Congrats, little bro, Marcus says, giving him a powerful hug. Lev can smell the alcohol on Marcus's breath. Today you're a man, sort of. Their father, sitting at the head of the table just a few feet away, lets out a nervous chuckle. Thanks. Sort of, Lev re responds. He glances at his parents. His father waits to see what's coming next, and his mother's pinched expression makes Lev feel tense. Marcus stares at Lev with a smile that doesn't hold any of the emotion a smile usually comes with. What do you think of all this? he asks Lev. It's great. Of course it is. All these people here for you? It's an amazing night. Amazing. Yeah says Lev. He's not sure where this is going, but he knows it's going somewhere. I'm having the time of my life. Damn right. Time of your life. Gotta wrap up all those life events, all those parties into one. Birthdays, wedding, funeral. Then he turns to their father. Very efficient, right, Dad? That's enough, their father says quietly, but it only makes Marcus get louder. What? I'm not allowed to talk about it? Oh, that's right. This is a celebration. I almost forgot. Lev wants Marcus to stop, but at the same time, he doesn't. Mom stands up and says in a voice more forceful than Dad's, Marcus, sit down. You're embarrassing yourself. By now, everyone in the banquet hall has stopped whatever they're doing and are turned into the unfolding family drama. 
Marcus, seeing he has the room's attention, picks up someone's half-empty glass of champagne and holds it high. Here's to my brother Lev, Marcus says, and to our parents who have always done the right thing, the appropriate thing, who have always given generously to charity, who have always given ten percent of everything to our church. Hey, Mom, we're lucky you had ten kids instead of five, otherwise we'd end up having to cut Lev off at the waist gasps from all assembled, people shaking their heads. Such disappointing behavior from an eldest son. Now Dad comes up and grabs Marcus's arm tightly. You're done, Dad says. Sit down. Marcus shakes Dad's arm off. Oh, I'll do better than sit down. Now there are tears in Marcus's eyes as he turns to Lev. I love you, bro, and I know this is your special day. But I can't be part of this. He hurls the champagne glass against the wall, where it shatters, spraying fragments of crystal all over the buffet table. Then he turns and storms out with such steady confidence in his stride that Lev realizes he's not drunk at all. Lev's father signals the band and they kick into a dance number, even before Marcus is gone from the huge room. People begin to fill the void of the dance floor, during their best, doing their best to make the awkward moment go away. I'm sorry about that, Lev, his father tells him. Why don't you, why don't you go dance? But Lev finds he doesn't want to dance anymore. The desire he had to be the center of the tension left along with his brother. I'd like to talk to Pastor Dan, if that's all right. Of course it is. Pastor Dan has been a family friend since before Lev was born, and he's always been much easier to talk to than his parents about any subject that required patience and wisdom. The banquet hall is too loud, too overcrowded, so they go outside to the patio overlooking the country club's golf course. Are you getting scared? Pastor Dan asks. He's always able to figure out what's on Lev's mind. Lev nods. I thought I was ready. I thought I was prepared. It's natural. Don't worry about it. But it doesn't ease the disappointment Lev feels in himself. He's had his entire life to prepare for this. It should have been enough. He knew he was a tithe from the time that he was little. You're special, his parents had always told him. Your life will be to serve God and mankind. He doesn't remember how old he was when he found out exactly what that meant for him. Have kids in school been giving you a hard time? No more than usual, Lev tells him. And it's true. All his life he's had to deal with kids who resented him because grown-ups treated him as if he was special. There were kids who were kind and kids who were cruel. That was life. It did bother him, though, when kids called him things like dirty unwind, as if he was like those other kids whose parents signed the unwind order to get rid of them. That couldn't be farther from the truth for Lev. He is his family's pride and joy. Straight A's in school, MVP in Little League. Just because he's to be unwound does not mean he's an unwind. There are, of course, a few other ties at his school, but they're all from other religions, so Lev has never felt a sense of camaraderie with them. The huge turnout at tonight's party testifies to how many friends Lev has. But they're not like him. Their lives will be lived in an undivided state. Their bodies and their futures are their own. Lev has always felt closer to God than to his friends, or even his family. He often wonders if being chosen always leaves a person so isolated. Or is there something wrong with him? I've been having lots of wrong thoughts, Lev tells Pastor Dan. There are no wrong thoughts, only thoughts that need to be worked through and overcome. Well, I've been feeling jealous of my brothers and sisters. I keep thinking of how the baseball team is going to miss me. I know it's an honor and a blessing to be a tithe, but I can't stop wondering why it has to be me. Pastor Dan, who's always so good at looking people in the eye, now looks away. It was decided before you were born. It's not anything you did or didn't do. Well, the thing is, I know tons of people with big families. Pastor Dan nodded, yes, it's very common these days. But lots of those people don't tithe at all, even families in our church, and nobody blames them. 
There are also people who tithe their first, second, or third child. Every family must make the decision for themselves. Your parents waited a long time before making the decision to have you. Lev reluctantly nods, knowing it's true. He was a true tithe, with five natural siblings, plus one adopted, and three that arrived by stork. Lev was exactly one-tenth. His parents had always told him that made him the more special. I'll tell you something, Lev. Pastor Dan fin says, finally meeting his eyes. Like Marcus, his eyes are moist, just one step short of tears. I've watched all of your brothers and sisters grow, and though I don't like playing favorites, I think you are the finest of all of them in so many ways. I wouldn't even know where to start. That's what God asks for, you know? Not first fruits, but best fruits. Thank you, sir. Pastor Dan always knows what to make say to make love feel better. I'm ready for this. And saying it makes him realize that in spite of his fears and misgivings, he truly is ready. This is everything he has lived for. Even so, his tithing party ends much too soon. In the morning, the Calders have to eat breakfast in the dining room with all the leaves in the table. All of Lev's brothers and sisters are there, only a few of them still live at home. But today, they've all come for breakfast. All of them, that is, except Marcus. Yet, for such a large family, it's unusually quiet, and the clatter of silverware on China makes the lack of conversation even more conspicuous. Lev, dressed in his silk tithing whites, eats carefully, so as not to leave any stain on his clothes. After breakfast, the goodbyes are long, full of hugs and kisses. It's the worst part. Lev wishes they would all just let him go and get the goodbyes over with. Pastor Dan arrives, he comes at Lev's request, and once he's there, the goodbyes move more quickly. Nobody wants to waste the pastor's valuable time. Lev is the first one out in his dad's Cadillac, and although he tries not to look back as his father starts the car and drives away, he can't help it. He watches as his home disappears behind him. I will never see that home again, he thinks. But he pushes a thought out of his mind. It's unproductive, unhelpful, selfish. He looks at Pastor Dan, who sits beside him in the back seat watching him, and the pastor smiles. It's all right, Lev, he says. Just hearing him say it makes it so. How far is the harvest camp? Lev asks to whoever cares to answer. It's about an hour from here, his mom says. And will they do it right away? His parents look to each other. I'm sure there'll be an orientation, says his father. That short answer makes it clear to Lev that they don't know any more than he does. As they pull out onto the interstate, Lev rolls down the window to feel the wind on his face and closes his eyes to prepare himself. This is what I was born for. It's what I've lived my life for. I am chosen. I am blessed. I am happy. Suddenly, his father slams on the brakes. With his eyes closed, Lev doesn't see the reason for their unexpected stop. He just feels the sharp deceleration of the Cadillac and the pull of the seatbelt on his shoulder. He opens his eyes to see that they've stopped on the interstate. Police lights flash, and was that a gunshot he heard? What's going on? Ben, just outside his window, was another, another kid, a few years older than him. He looks scared. He looks dangerous. Lev reach over, reaches over to quickly put up his window, but before he can, this kid reaches in, pulls up the lock on the door, and tugs the door open. Lev is frozen. He doesn't know what to do. Mom? Dad? He calls. The boy with murder in his eyes tugs on Lev's white shirt, silk shirt, trying to pull him out of the car, but the belt, the seatbelt holds him tight. What are you doing? Leave me alone! Lev. Or Lev's mom screams for his father to do something, but he's fumbling with his own seatbelt. The maniac reaches over and in one swift motion unclips Lev's seatbelt. Pastor Dan grabs at the intruder, who responds with a quick, powerful punch, a jab right at Pastor Dan's jaw. The shock of seeing such violence distracts Lev at a crucial moment. The maniac tugs on him again, and this time Lev falls out of the car, hitting his head on the pavement. When he looks up, he sees his father finally getting out of the car, but the crazy kid swings the car door against him, sending him flying. 